Good afternoon. Um, I don't want a feedback. Uh, I guess we'll get started. Um, thank you all for coming today. My name is Tim. I've been around the Kubernetes project for a long time. Um, I have worked in a bunch of different areas within Kubernetes, uh, but mostly I've focused sort of at the lower end of the stack, networking, storage, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, more recently, I've become interested in multi-cluster work, which uh, is not new to Kubernetes, but is sort of uh, experiencing a bit of a renaissance, I think. Um, I think everybody's coming to the, this idea that we're, 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 we're gonna deal with multi-cluster. And as I've been staring at customers and listening to them talk about what they're doing with multi-cluster and networking and things, I had a realization. I really, to be fair, I really wanted to do this talk. It didn't get into KubeCon, so I came here. You guys are probably gonna do it a bunch of times. You're the first time I'm, I'm trying this talk out, so we'll see how this goes. Um, it is my belief that we've already made a mesh. Now, anybody who didn't get the joke, you're supposed to think of this guy, right? It's quite a mesh we made. Um, if you don't get the joke, talk to me later. <laughs> That's probably the best joke I'll make today. Okay. I got the right, I got the right audience. So, one of the things I get to do at Google is talk to customers and listen to customers. Um, and a lot of customers today are talking about, asking about, Service mesh, how do, I, how do I do these things that service mesh offers them? Now, service mesh is super hyped, right? Everybody's heard about it, it's all over the media and the, all the trade rags are talking about how you have to have it. Well, you know, we'll leave that for the debates there. Um, but clearly, when I talk to a lot of users, they really do want some of what service mesh offers to them. What do I mean by that? I really mean, let's look at a, a couple properties of what I, I mean by service mesh. Service virtualization, so virtual IPs, virtual names, the idea that a service is not just the endpoints behind the service, that there's actually an abstraction there. Endpoint management, this is managing all the things behind that abstraction, so all of the pods or all the VMs or all of the machines that, are, that make up a service. Uh, that includes things like health checking and removing dead nodes from your uh, service pool and those sorts of things. Generally, when people talk about service mesh, they talk about client-side load balancing. They want the decisions, the smarts, to be on the other side. They don't want to put a box in the middle that concentrates all the logic. They want it to be smarter. Traffic management is a big part of service mesh. I want to be able to do fault injection. I want to be able to traffic split. I want to do a blue-green deployment, or I want to do a 1% experiment. These sorts of things become really important when you operate a bunch of microservices at scale. Building all those things into your applications is incredibly difficult, right? And it's a never-ending cycle. There's always going to be some new feature uh, that you want. Identity is a big deal. Anybody who's written microservices knows as soon as you've got two things talking on the network, you've got to figure out who the other guy is and, uh, and, and understand, is he allowed to talk to me? Is he allowed to do this operation? Access control is the other side of that. Are you, are you allowed to do this? Um, telemetry, what happened? Who talked to what? How often? What number of errors did I have over what period of time? Encryption, zero trust. One of the top things I hear from people who are interested in service mesh is, I just want MTLS. I don't want to deal with encryption myself because I'm going to get it wrong, right? Like anybody here who's implemented a, a TLS-based service-to-service communications, like how often do you rotate your certificates? Anybody? Yeah, exactly. You, you probably don't because it's hard, right? It's hard to get right. Service mesh tends to capture these things. It may be more, but these are the sort of eight that I think of the most. Um, they offer these things as a bundle, like get service mesh, get these things for free. There are a lot of mesh offerings out there, right? If you Google for service mesh, you will be, you'll get about as many hits as if you Google for Kubernetes, right? It's a, it's a lot. Typically, service meshes are implemented in terms of proxies. These things that sit next to your application and manage the traffic for you. These are the, the places where your authentication, where your MTLS, where your certificate revocation lists or rotations, uh, where they happen. They're separated from the application, moved into a dedicated piece of software. 
the proxy. Now there's lots of proxies out there that implement this. Some people call it middleware, API gateways, just sort of middle boxes. There's sidecar proxies that run in your pod alongside your application and sort of everything in between. Typically, when we talk about a proxy, we talk about L7, we're talking about HTTP or application level awareness. There has been, in the last three years, a ton of thinking and R&D and experimenting happening around service meshes. It's really exciting. It's completely decoupled from Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes users tend to want service mesh, but it's not part of Kubernetes. So my assertion is, we already have a service mesh. We have already, not really on purpose, built a service mesh. If I may be so bold, I know this is a bit of a live wire, I'm gonna to try to convince you that we have a service mesh and then we can talk about what do we do with that. But I wanna modify the statement a little bit. What we've built is actually a really primitive, very basic service mesh. It does not capture all of those eight things on the, board, on, on the list earlier, and I'm not sure that it should. But I do think we have the service mesh. For better or for worse, it's not very general purpose. It works within a single cluster. Um, you know, it works at L4, it works not really at L7. Um, but I wanna go back and look at those eight properties again. So, number one, service virtualization. Service, Kubernetes API service, was one of the very first APIs inside Kubernetes. It was there in 1.0, I think it was one of the first five abstractions. It's kind of at the heart of the way people use Kubernetes. Generally, when we talk about a service, we're talking about a cluster IP service, which has a virtual IP. So we're starting to touch on service virtualization now. Um, there's a way to say service type load balancer. Many of the load balancer implementations now have an internal option through an annotation. So now you can expose it into your network. Uh, and services automatically plug into DNS. Cube DNS comes out of the box, or uh, a core DNS comes out of the box now with Kubernetes. So service virtualization, we've got VIPs, we've got names, we've got abstraction. I think we get that one. Endpoint management. Services in Kubernetes select pods via label selectors, right? This is again sort of at the foundations of what makes Kubernetes uh, interesting, I think. Those endpoints are automatically managed by Kubernetes, right? If a pod fails its readiness probe, it gets removed from the endpoint set for that service, and consumers of the service mesh don't need to be aware of the fact that anything happened, right? Nobody is doing all the hard work except for Kubernetes. We now have a new API called Endpoint Slice, which uh, is going beta but not on by default in the next rev of Kubernetes, which takes the idea of endpoint management and actually expands it even further, makes it a little bit more generic, a little more general purpose. Client side load balancing. I have been on record many times saying Kube proxy is not really a proxy. It's totally a misnomer. Uh, it's, a, it's a historical artifact. Actually, it's not really true. Cube proxy turns your node into a proxy, right? It, the kernel on your Kubernetes machine is in fact proxying all the traffic. It looks at every packet that comes through. Uh, it makes decisions about routing. It can do fault injection. We don't use that in Kubernetes, but we could. Uh, these are all the sort of properties of a, of a proxy, right? Now, it's a pretty dumb proxy. It's a low touch proxy. Doesn't change the source address, it doesn't uh, do L7 processing, although, gosh, the kernel can do KHTTP now, so even that starts to get interesting. Um, but I, I think the kernel actually is a proxy. So talk about traffic management. Services in Kubernetes operate at layer four, right? That's an IP plus a port, uh, IP protocol plus a port. Um, this is really coarse. It's really sort of only barely useful when we start talking about service mesh, but it, it's not zero useful. It's just, you know, epsilon. Um, we have this other API called Ingress. You might have heard about it. Uh, it operates at L7, and it actually does have a lot more capabilities. Now, it doesn't have very many capabilities compared to what, uh, say, Envoy or Istio or Linkerd will, will offer, uh, but it does have some L7 capabilities. The problem with it is it's not very portable. People tend to go beyond the basic capabilities very quickly, and they end up in the non-portable space. It only targets Kubernetes services, which is a, maybe a problem. We'll come back to that in, in a few minutes. Um, we are working on it to go to V1 uh, GA. Anybody who cares about this, there's gonna be a, a group meeting at uh, KubeCon to talk about how to get ingress towards GA. Um, 
it's not really what Ingress was designed for. It's not really designed to be a, an east-west service mesh thing. But some people are kind of using it for that. Identity. Kubernetes has identity. Right? We have service accounts. We've had service accounts for a long time, actually. When you start a pod, you automatically, unless you opt out, you get service account credentials that identify who you are according to the Kubernetes API server, which actually has a certificate authority and has signed a certificate for you. You probably don't use this. It's really only useful right now for talking to the Kubernetes API server, but it is there. And in fact, there's APIs in the Kubernetes API server that can take a, uh, a service account token and let you ask the API server, is this in fact the person who it says it there? Right? So you can actually build a certificate system based on Kubernetes already. But it doesn't operate on the wire. Right? When you do a packet sniff, there is no identity on the wire. So if I receive a packet from you, I don't actually know which identity is associated with that packet. I can try to look up the IP address and reverse map that into a service account, but it's not really ideal. And it doesn't work with things like network policy. We actually have policy APIs, and they ignore identity. So talking about policy APIs, network policy, uh, I think one of my more favorite APIs that nobody uses uh, lets you describe a graph of what's allowed to talk to what on your, on your namespace. It is described in terms of pod selectors, not in terms of identity. Uh, and uh, you know, because the identity is not on the wire, you can't make assumptions about it. But already we're starting to see some implementations of networking and network policy in Kubernetes that do in fact put the identity on the wire. So it's actually sort of uh, beginning to be interesting. Telemetry, observability. Kubernetes has almost nothing here by default. Right? Out of the box, there's, there's almost nothing. Um, there are a bunch of third-party implementations of network telemetry uh, that trap in at the networking layer and give you more visibility. But honestly, we're not doing real well here. One of the most frequently things, most frequently asked for things that I hear from customers is, is more information about what's going on at the service level. And encryption, similar boat, we don't have a whole lot there for Kubernetes. Uh, not out of the box anyway. And again, it's not on the wire. There's a bunch of networking implementations out there that do offer this. They offer IPsec or other mechanisms for getting encryption on the wire, uh, but it's not built in. So going back, keeping score. I, I tried to be conservative with my scores, but I felt pretty good about this. There's three that I think we killed. Nailed it, no problem. There's two that are kind of in danger and uh, two that are clearly not being met, right? So not the best score. Maybe I'm not doing the best job of convincing you yet. Don't worry though, I think we can do better. So given this, let's assume I put maybe the seed of a, of a conviction in your brain. What are we gonna do with this? Well, strictly speaking, we don't need to do anything, right? We're, we're doing our thing, we're, we're on our own track, and mostly people are pretty happy with what Kubernetes offers, but we're starting to see, at least I am, I don't know how your customers are, more and more customers who want the capability of service mesh. They want that telemetry, they want that encryption, they want smarter identity. I think we should not be shy about this. We have a mesh, it's okay. Like, say it loud and proud, we have a service mesh. It's built into Kubernetes. This doesn't invalidate what goes on with real meshes. This doesn't diminish what Linkerd or Istio or any of the other projects have done in any way. And if, if anything, it makes them more valid. Like it proves independently, not even on purpose, we invented a bunch of the same ideas, right? There's tons of R&D happening in mesh though. So we should be paying attention to this. And I say we, the people who are working on multi-cluster and on networking in particular in Kubernetes space, we should be looking at what these things are doing and saying, what are the good ideas? I'm not above stealing. How far do we want to go with this though? You know, let's have a conversation about our intentions here. Um, how general purpose do we want to make this thing? Do we want to put ourselves in a place where Kubernetes is competing with Istio or you know, our ecosystem of service meshes? Right? From the beginning of the Kubernetes project, we've been pretty clear. We want to enable the ecosystem. We don't want to eat the ecosystem. We want to find things that we can do that make the ecosystem more successful. So maybe the right question here is, are there things that we can ingest into Kubernetes that make service mesh better and more powerful? Right? It is my proposition that service mesh is in general a good thing for users. It's a good pattern for users to follow. And the more that we can offload from their application into the system, the better off they're going to be. 
what can we do with that? So my opinions, uh, I think it should be trivial, easy, incremental for a user to move from bare Kubernetes into something like a full service mesh. You should not need to stop, reinvent everything you've already done, and then start over again, right? And this is true in some service mesh systems. You stop Kubernetes, it doesn't provide you any more runway, you climb an enormous cliff to get back to where you were in the first place, and then you get to start over again. I think Kubernetes should be general purpose enough to handle most workloads. We've been pretty clear about that from the beginning of Kubernetes. Um, that means I think the service mesh should be more general purpose. I think, I, I think it should handle more use cases for people. There are users out there, lovely, lucky users, who don't have to deal with any legacy. They're truly greenfield. They should be able to lean on Kubernetes for these things. Um, and I think we should really start thinking hard about breaking down the walls around a cluster. Right? For the longest time, we in Kubernetes land have sort of put our fingers in our ears and sing a song that the world outside the cluster doesn't exist and all we have to do is deal with stuff inside. It's just not true. I do not think that we should build or bundle a fully featured service mesh in Kubernetes today. I do not intend to jam Istio or Linkerd into the out of the box Kubernetes experience. Right? I think we need that ecosystem. That is what made Kubernetes successful from the beginning. We need to continue to enable that. That said, we should learn from the experiences of others. We should lean on extensibility. Extensibility is, is part of the ethos that has made Kubernetes successful so far. Uh, so we should definitely lean on that and, and work with it. It should be easy for implementers of service meshes to add things to Kubernetes that add new value on top of what Kubernetes already offers. This is the incremental adoption story. So I'd like to float a few concrete things that I think we can do. I have no idea how I'm doing for time. I forgot to start my timer. So I'm just going to keep talking until somebody tells me to stop. Um, I, this was originally scheduled as a lightning talk, if you can imagine. Um, <laughs> Uh, I offered to do this one and the next session at the same time. Um, so some concrete things. What about endpoints that are not pods? What if I have a VM and I want to talk to that VM in the same way that I talk to my Kubernetes services, or a set of VMs, right? If you're on Amazon, you have auto-scaling groups. If you're on Google, you have instance groups. If you're on Azure, I feel bad for you. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I've had this over and over from customers. Like, can I, can I include my, my, instance, my, my VM instances in my Kubernetes services? We even have an affordance now in Kubernetes for it. We have um, selectorless services with manual endpoints. So you can actually go and do this yourself. It's a little clunky and it's a little bit hard. Uh, it's not very general purpose. Um, maybe we want an abstraction. Like maybe we actually want to formalize this one step further. I'm not really sure about this one. Talked about it with people, and there's some things we can do with it, and then there's, you know, maybe we just don't need it. Like, I want to keep Kubernetes as simple as I can. I'm the one who always has to push back on people for designing against hypotheticals. Um, I'm not sure we need this. We've got this new endpoint slice API that I mentioned earlier. That might actually be enough. It might be good enough for us to represent the back ends of a service in a way that is more extensible than we can do today. So I think this is a place where we could spend some, some brain power and think about what do we want to do here? Um, at the end of the day, we've always got out-of-core CRDs and controllers, which I love. It's one of these extension points that uh, we didn't really think would have this result, but it has completely changed the way people work with Kubernetes. So maybe that's the right answer here. I think we need to replace Ingress. In fact, we've already started this, right? Anybody who's used Ingress is familiar with how little it can actually express. Um, and uh, this has been a problem, a pain point for a long time. So we've started this process of designing uh, a new API that is more expressive, more powerful, up levels the conversation around what Ingress can do, takes actually the, the main concept and breaks it into a couple of concepts so it's more reusable. I actually have hope that we can express both L4 and L7 through the same basic API with, with the extensibility. Um, focusing on the right extension points, the ability for a, a real service mesh to add differentiated value in a way that doesn't negate the original API. So a user doesn't have to stop what they're doing and rewrite, they can just extend. 
This is going to require plugin implementations. This is not going to be something that Kubernetes has uh, by default. Now, I say that, and then I will also say we have a meeting this week to discuss whether uh, we should have a by default ingress in Kubernetes. So uh, I don't think it will become part of the Kubernetes project. I think we might potentially consider maybe, possibly, shipping an implementation along with Kubernetes so that people who turn on Kubernetes for the first time don't run into a brick wall saying, why doesn't this work? Oh, you don't have a plugin for it. Um, there'll be a kept coming soon. So for people who are interested in the evolution of Ingress and uh, L7 in particular, watch the SIG network for this kept. Cube proxy, this thing that has been part of Kubernetes since the very beginning, the thing that implements services uh, that everybody assumes is part of Kubernetes and, and required, it really isn't. It's actually an implementation of an API. It's as much a plugin as anything else, right? And we don't treat it that way because of historical reasons, um, but I think we actually should. I think we should lean into the idea that it's not privileged or special, that it's actually effectively a sort of first party plugin. Um, and I think what we can do with that is we can actually get some arm's length uh, perspective on what it should be doing and how it should be doing those things and consider whether it on its own, for example, could you run Cube Proxy on a VM that isn't part of your Kubernetes cluster in order to enable that VM to be part of your Kubernetes mesh, right? It effectively is a sidecar, right? We don't treat it that way. It's just built into Kubernetes and you know, I don't know if I want to support that mode, but I think it's worth thinking about. Service account, network policy. I think there's a gap here. I think we should be able to express policies in terms of service accounts. Most of the implementations out there will cook that down into IP addresses, but the user will be able to express their intent a lot more clearly. And that's always what I've tried to do with Kubernetes, is to make it the intention of the user, not the how do you go about getting that. Um, I think it would be more general purpose. Uh, the problem that we have today, if I, if I have a pod, everybody tries to draw the service graph of Kubernetes, which service is talking to which other service. And unfortunately, service is the most useless word in our industry, um, so we chose it for our prime abstraction. Um, which service is talking to which service? Well, a pod isn't born into a service, right? A pod is, you can change the labels on, and now it's part of the service, and then later it's not, right? And that was largely by design, but it makes it complicated to make a policy assertion based on which services are the source of a packet, right? A pod, however, is born into a service account. And that service account is not mutable. You cannot change it at runtime during the pod. So if you're gonna describe policy, this seems like a more stable base for describing policies that would actually be much more reasonable to implement. And for those implementations that can actually carry identity on the wire, Right? If you have an overlay and you can jam it into your overlay packet or if you're smart and you swizzle it into the bits of the IP header or whatever you're doing, bully for you, you can actually do identity-based access control. Multi-cluster. The, there's a big hole in the wall that we need to continue to break away at. Um, there is a world outside of our walls of a single cluster. And I think we need to, as a community, embrace that and think about it more with sort of every abstraction that we're working with. Cross-cluster identity, what does it mean for me to be able to talk to another cluster? Today, the mechanisms of copying service account keys are really baroque and, and pretty clunky. Um, Cross-cluster services, can I merge the service space between clusters so that a user in cluster A can find services in cluster B with relative ease. Today it's a nightmare, right? I don't know why we made this so hard for ourselves. Um, network policy, can I apply these same policy rules that I talked about before across clusters? Health checking, this is one of my newest, favorite, favoritest pet peeves. Kubernetes has always taken a bit of a hands-off approach to health checking. We said pods have optional probes for your health checking, uh, those probes don't have to be on the network, there's an exec probe. For those probes that are on the network, they don't have to be HTTP, they can be plain old TCP connect based probe. So we have this wide variety of ways that you can choose to implement probe or not. Um, this is not sufficient for building higher level network systems, right? Plugging Kubernetes pods into higher level service meshes without health checks 
is kind of a recipe for pain. And a lot of these higher level services demand health checks. So now people who are implementing for Kubernetes have to fake it, right? We have fake health checks to plug into load balancers on cloud providers so that we can do uh, integration with their load balancing, right? It's not something I'm super proud of. It kind of works. Um, I think we need to do better. Now, how do I do that retroactively? I cannot go out to all of you and say, oh, by the way, all of your pods need to have a health check starting now, right? That's not gonna work. So we gotta figure out uh, some incremental plan here. How do we move forward with this? But I think we need, to, we need to do this. And logically, as much as I hate to say this, the health check belongs with service. Service is my least favorite API. Um, it's a big grab bag of random things uh, and but this is where the, the health check, I think, logically belongs. So I think we need to do some thinking uh, around this. So, you know, coming sort of towards the end, uh, I've laid out why I think Kubernetes is a mesh. Now, I don't know if I've convinced you, um, but from my perspective, I see a ton of things we can do that if we did them, and I do this talk next year, I think I'll have you, right? It's not a very good mesh. I think we can do better. Uh, I think we can make it easier for real meshes to build on top of Kubernetes by taking some of the hardest parts of the problems and onboarding it either into Kubernetes or into sort of very adjacent projects. Uh, and I think that if we come back here next year and we talk about the state of service mesh and Kubernetes, I, I hope that it's in a much better state and that people are not so uh, constrained by the edges of their clusters. Uh, so there you go, Kubernetes is a mesh, the end. And now I'm happy to defend my thesis. Uh, so you talked about the, the eight areas. Yes. Um, and I feel like you glossed over routing. Okay. You talked about client-side load balancing, but there's yeah. a lot of things that they're trying to put into the, the intervening proxies. From yes. The Um, so I think within Kubernetes proper, I think we need to be pretty loose. We need to be pretty hands-off. I don't think we can start ingesting a bunch of L7 capabilities uh, into Kube proxy. I'm willing to come back and reevaluate that statement. Um, as I see it today, what I see opportunities for are relatively simple things like traffic splitting, fault injection, uh, circuit breaking. Like, we have information about connections. We don't always have information about packets, right? If you open an HTTP connection to another service, I don't really know how many requests you're sending back and forth, but I can tell whether you're over a certain threshold of total throughput, right? Or I can tell whether too many connections are going to a single backend or coming into a single backend. So I can do load shedding. Um, I could describe traffic splitting and say, you know, I, I would like to send 1% of my traffic off to this new version of my application. Um, so I think we should aim for something in the middle there, if we do anything at all. And actually, I, I don't want to say that I'm convinced. I'm not convinced that we need to do anything there. Um, I'm saying that we have actually the mechanism, the hook is sort of there already. So if we wanted to go there, it's not actually that awful. How would you compare what I gather your proposal is to incrementally manipulate as aspects all over Kubernetes versus a potential alternative of taking an existing control plane, we'll just use Istio as an example, but it could be one of, one of the other service meshes, and plugging it into Kubernetes as CRDs where, where Kubernetes effectively is the control plane for service mesh, but the service mesh is completely outside Kubernetes, aside from you're using the Kubernetes API to get to the control plane. Um, so the question is, if I can uh, summarize, why not consider embedding a, a, an existing mesh um, as, and use Kubernetes as the control plane? So some of these meshes already do this, right? Istio installs itself as about 800 CRDs in your cluster um, and then says, forget all the things you used to know about Kubernetes, go use this new API, right? It's kind of a disaster from a usability point of view, right? Um, if we were to adapt those APIs into a place where they were consistent and they were common across implementations, then we're starting to get 
to a more usable place. Um, and there are projects out there that are starting to sort of aim in this direction, right? Um, uh, there's a, there's a, it feels like there's an inflection point somewhere well, in there. Just because one was a disaster and the first one sure. doesn't mean it has to be that way, right? I, I agree. I agree. It doesn't have to be a disaster. Um, I think what I want to do is find the most common things. If I can solve 70% of the problems for 70% of the users, I'm pretty happy, right? And then the, the real meshes can differentiate beyond that. They can extend. What I'm really focused on is, can I take away the most painful, inconsistent, hard to use parts and make those simple and standard and obvious and give you the extension points you need to go off and do crazy stuff? Well, I'll maybe hijack this because I didn't see other hands pop up quick enough anyway, but I'll add a side note <laughs> comment. To the advantage of plugging in as a CRD is that there are a lot of things outside Kubernetes that you'd like to see in the mesh. You mentioned yep. legacy VMs, there's IoT devices, yep. uh, frankly, even extra serverless clusters and clusters that might not even be owned by your organization. So yep. it strikes me that a mesh external to Kubernetes may be. Right. So I should be really clear here I'm not necessarily proposing that Kubernetes proper ingests all of this. I'm saying that Kubernetes is sort of the umbrella effort and project should be paying attention to this and should be learning from this and finding ways to enable this, right? So these, the things that we're talking about here, they may actually end up as CRDs in the xcates.io space, right? Or they may end up as CRDs in the SMI space, right? If, if that turns out to be the right way to go about this. Um, I'm actually completely ambivalent about how that ends up and actually not 100% true. I really think they should end up as CRD because CRD is the direction that we're pushing everybody, right? So uh, there was a, I did a talk uh, last year on why everything should be a CRD. So I, I definitely think we should be moving in the direction of CRD. Which namespace those things fall under and sort of whose governance I think is really the, the thing that we need to, we need to figure out. Question there, sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, you know what, talking about CRDs, um, I think also you mentioned last year that finally things like deployment or stateful set, they shouldn't be, uh, I mean, they shouldn't be part of, um, I mean, they shouldn't be uh, pro, uh, special citizens, right? They should be, I mean, they could be as well part of, I mean, they, they could be based on CRDs, right? So where, um, where are you with this direction? Are you going to extract uh, such high-level uh, objects into their own CRDs and make them at the same level as other CRDs? Um, deployments in particular? Yeah, deployments. Um, right now, there's not any work underway to do that that I know of. There's a, still a bunch of issues with CRDs that, present, that prevent this. Um, there's performance issues uh, and there's um, some scalability stuff, but, but CRD is coming along. Um, we are still, unfortunately, adding some built-in APIs. This endpoint slice API went in as a built-in because it was specifically a scalability problem, like there's a scalability problem with endpoints, and so we wanted to fix it. CRDs can only serialize to JSON. They can't serialize to Proto. JSON is a huge scalability problem in itself. So when we tried to do it as a CRD, we actually erased all the scalability wins that we had won back by changing the API. Um, so that's feedback now for the CRD and API machinery team of like, actually to be really able to ingest the entirety of the Kubernetes space, we need to get rid of the JSON requirement. Um, so uh, there's, there's little problems like that. Um, but mostly, nobody's working on it right now. Like, literally taking deployment to turn it into a CRD, it's a big project for Kubernetes overall. Nobody's made it a priority. Like, it's possible, actually, deployment's an interesting one, because I think, actually, it could probably, probably could work. But I haven't tried it myself. So there seems to be like a, a theme in the talk that I liked about extensibility in these use cases you have designed for that are now being applied. One of those is this idea that you could scale pods or deployments to zero replicas, and when you get traffic, scale up at least to a certain request. But um, you know, open fast that I maintain, relooking at two to five seconds, even if the image is pre pulled on a single node cluster, with Knative it can be up to like 20 seconds. So what, what do you think can help us in those projects in terms of like how could we reduce that time? I, do you have a, like a Pareto that shows where the time's going? So I don't have an exact breakdown, but there's a number of events, and I think because Kubernetes is eventually consistent and not yeah. like a state machine, there, there's additional overhead there as well, all over the place. 
sure. Um, Okay. Um, I don't. Ha I don't have. At least one I don't have a concrete answer for you. Um, I would say, uh, if we can identify the places where a startup is slow unnecessarily, we, we should go after them. Like the readiness. If you don't have a readiness, you shouldn't need to wait a second. Uh, and if you, even if you do have a readiness, and it's like we should define what the protocol is. Maybe maybe we want a fast start on that, uh, or something like. I think uh, these are maybe like second order problems. We've now gotten through the obvious stuff. Now we're into the less obvious stuff. Do you, do you have any tests that run on each release that time that? Like how long it starts to schedule a pod in search traffic? No, we might have tests, but I don't think they're measuring it sort of that granularity. I would, I, if anybody saw one second, they'd be like, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, I don't know the answer to that. Um, we have, <laughs> the body of our tests has grown quite large. Uh, so I don't know specifically if there's a test that covers exactly that. It seems reasonable. It seems like if you set all the preconditions, like you've managed to arrange the pre-poll, which by the way, we don't really have an official API for, um, which itself is a problem. Um, but if you've satisfied all those things, yeah, maybe you should be able to start less than half a second at 90p or something. Right? It seems reasonable. I'd look at that, Cab. Other questions? Anybody want to yell at me? You, you mentioned like eight total areas of focus, and then a couple of them have plugin implementation as an option under there. Do you see any kind of uh, opportunity for like a uh, common mesh interface or, or some kind of, you know, we have the CRI, and the, is, is there an emerging standard that folks need to think about? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, there are a couple of projects out there that are trying to make standard mesh interfaces. SMI, the service mesh interface, is, oh, okay. is one. Um, last I looked, there wasn't a lot there. Like the API was like two, there were two things. Um, but you know, everything starts slow. So maybe that's the right API, I don't know. I think as a community, we should be looking at like, all prior art, right? Um, and in fact, uh, you know, as we look at this uh, ingress replacement I mentioned, um, you know, we did a survey of the landscape and like what APIs are out there that do sort of specifically north-south, but in general HTTP balancing, what do we like about those APIs? So we stole a couple of things from the Istio API that I like and we jettisoned a whole lot. And we stole a couple of things from the Contour API and we jettisoned some things. And we stole some things from SMI and we jettisoned some, like, I think that that API in as much as it's a proposal, uh, ca captures what I think of as sort of the best patterns, but it's pre-KEP at this point, so yeah. the KEP will be coming soon, and like, let's fight about it. Yeah, yeah, get in there and test it out. Like totally, and really what I'm looking for is for the implementers to come in and say, I can implement this against my various implementations, right, and you've given me the extension hooks that I need to be able to offer like value add if I want to, you know, nobody has to, but if you're a vendor of a, of a proxy and you want to add value, you should be able to. That's what our extension mechanisms are about, right? Um, can you please demo of your project uh, who are working towards what you have described? For example, push some mesh functionality into a plugin in Kubernetes? Uh, I don't think anybody's working on it in the way that I'm describing here. Because yeah. the because the extension mechanisms don't exist. Like ingress is not extensible in the way that you need it to be in order to do differentiated work here. Now uh, Alejandro's around somewhere, um, and you know like the nginx ingress implementation, for example, has dozens of annotations, and all those annotations trigger cool specific nginx functionality that isn't part of the ingress API, and they're doing their best to offer value add on top of ingress, but it's a crappy API. Right, like annotations are like, they have gotten out of control, and this is why we're looking at revamping the Ingress API. Right? Oh, there he is. Right. So there are drafts or something. So there's two there's two things in flight. There's the Ingress v1 cap, which is moving Ingress from from perma beta, which it's, Ingress has been beta for two and a half years, um, moving Ingress from beta to GA. One of the things that we're changing in there is making it more extensible. So you can target something that isn't a, a service, for example. Um, it's a you know, micro adjustment, and, uh, but it's better than nothing. 
Um, and then the other is this doc that uh, some of the folks have sent to SIG Network in the last month or so, um, which will be turning into a KEP very soon, and that will be describing a much more uh, full-featured extensibility story. Maybe another topic is uh, how the relationship of, of the Kubernetes and the Istio in Google, and how, how do you work together? Um, within Google, I mean, there are two separate teams that run under two separate directors, actually several separate directors. Um, we know each other, we you know talk, um, there's no particular linkage. We're not like my first hat that I wear is open source, right? And I am one of the, I tr trust myself as one of the stewards of Kubernetes. Like I've said from the beginning, I'm not taking stuff that I don't want into Kubernetes. If I don't think it actually services users and focuses on the right places, if it's too complicated, we're not going to do it in Kubernetes. And we've always said ecosystem <coughs> is sort of outside of our turf. We are now starting to say, maybe we're actually overlapping a little bit. So, you know, I've talked to the Istio folks. I've floated some of these ideas past them, mostly from a, um, if we did this, could you implement it, right? Uh, the answer so far has been yes, but they're gonna be part of the conversation as if they were a third party, right? Like, we're, they don't get any special privilege here. All right, thank you all. I'll be hanging around outside.